I'm here today to talk about a little library I wrote that, as the title promises, lets you create beautiful spreadsheets with pure data, um, which is, I think, something a lot of us want to do. Before I start, I want to ask everybody, how many people here have had to create data for people who want to consume it in Excel or another spreadsheet for it? That's what I figured. <laughs> a lot of you. OK, so just shout out, how have you created that data? I heard, see, I heard com, uh, comma separated values. Is there any other answer? XML? OK, directly. Um, FOI, OK, cool, cool, cool. So uh, we'll talk about all of those except direct creation, for, creation through XML, which is um, such an ill-conceived thing to do. It's exactly, <laughs> it's exactly what I did, um, <laughs> or part of what I did. Um, OK, so let me start by describing everyone's first reaction when they find out that they have to generate Excel. Why do I have to do this? Who's making me do this? Why can't I do something more modern than Excel? And I want to start by resetting that expectation a little bit, right? So here we are. We're in the Girding Theater. We're with all our colleagues and friends. We're communicating very easily and clearly. We speak English to each other. It's easy. We talk about the same subjects. We know about the same subjects. We're making deep connections. This is great. But let's do a thought experiment for a sec. Say we got on an airplane and went across to Madrid, Spain. That would be cool. We end up in a cafe in Madrid, Spain, and now we can speak to Spanish people and learn and make connections in Spain, except that we're still speaking English. Now, we'll be able to speak English successfully to some people in Madrid, because there are lots of English speakers there, but our connections will never be as deep as if we switch into Spanish and learn Spanish. So the lesson there is, well, there's the old phrase, when in, the, when in Rome, do as the Romans, here, when in Madrid, do as ma the Madrilianos, um, is that we should talk to people in the language that works if we want to make deep connections, right? This may seem like an aside from Excel. Give me a sec. So in our corporate life, in our programming life, we often live in environments where we have to give quantitative information to people. I saw a lot of hands go up when I talked about who had to give people Excel. And when in business land, we want to talk the language of the business people. Our goal is to communicate with them and create a connection around the data that we have. And we know that the language they speak is Excel. So what I want to propose is that if we're going to have to give them Excel, we want to do it as well as we can. The best communication comes when we deeply embrace a language, right? And Excel here is the language that we're talking about, OK? So hopefully I've given you some motivation there. Let's talk about what it would mean to embrace Excel and what makes Excel awesome. So there are a set of things that we can think about when we think about Excel, and I'm not going to be exhaustive. Um, but there's certainly formatting, right? Excel gives us all sorts of formatting. It gives us all the sort of usual bolding and fonts. It gives us number formats. It gives us conditional formats that allow us to um, create formatting based on value. We have this idea of transparency, and transparency is really important to me. Um, what I mean by transparency here is when data in an Excel spreadsheet is derived from other data, we have quantitative data that's derived from other data, we can actually see that in an Excel spreadsheet because we can directly inspect the formulas and the dependencies that data has. This turns out to be really powerful in real corporate settings where you're trying to communicate with people around data because all parties to the communication can look at the way the data has been derived. You still have original data, um, but I can't tell you how much confusion. When we were using this at Staples, we were able to get around a lot of confusion in communication when we could use formulas and share them in spreadsheets that we were working on. Sorting and uh, filtering are sort of obvious. One of the real things about sorting and filtering that you might not think about if you don't use Excel is Excel is often used to push around fairly large chunks of data. At Staples, again, we pushed around weekly product lists that were 20 to 30,000 products long in Excel, and that was how we would communicate. And that turned out to be effective because we could use sorting and filtering to look at the things that the listener cared about, that the reader cared about. 
Aggregation, of course, is related to that. We can reduce data by aggregating it. Um, and see, here I'm showing baseball data, um, which is not that important, but uh, here I'm, and so we can see hits by team. And then, of course, what we all know about Excel is we can do charting, okay? So, um, charting is pretty cool, because then we can, we can uh, see all the charts. So as we look at all of these things, um, we see that we have a lot of tools in Excel that give us the ability to create very rich reports. And we can embrace these tools and create these rich reports, but we still haven't gotten to what's really powerful about using Excel as a communication mechanism. And what that is is that Excel documents, spreadsheets, are living documents. When someone gets one, they can operate on the data directly. They can operate on the document directly. They can bring data from other sources. They can do all sorts of things like that. Um, and so they've received something much more powerful than looking at a table on a web page, for instance, right? Now there are other tools that you can do this with, but Excel is super powerful at doing this. Okay, so now we have some data that looks like this. This is a sequence of maps of something, right? And we want something that looks like that an Excel spreadsheet with all sorts of formatting and charts and everything else. How do I do this? People have mentioned a bunch of these things. I'm going to run through them real quick and not talk about any of them in too much detail until we get to the one I wrote, of course. Um, but I'm going to try and show you why the one I, what, what motivated me to, to do it yet a different way. So how do I make a spreadsheet? First method is comma separated values. Um, comma separated values um, give us a couple of things, right? They're super easy to do. They can be read by all sorts of systems besides Excel, but they're not beautiful. And so we don't like that so much. Like, I know a lot of people did it and, and that's, that turns out to be a problem. We won't talk about that much. The second method is Visual Basic for applications. This is awesome because it's self-service. Right? People can create their own VBA applications. Lots of analysts know VBA. Um, they can do anything you want to do in Excel, but it's kind of a disaster from a control point of view. You get business logic built into spreadsheets. They wander around organizations. No one knows what the organization is actually doing. Um, and there's a whole bunch written about this that I'm not going to go into here, but we can talk about later if people are interested in. Someone mentioned POI. Um, POI is a great Apache library for talking to Excel from Java. Um, you can do almost anything you can do in, in raw Excel through POI. Um, and uh, so we, uh, we, we can keep all the logic that we've created in the same types of systems that we keep our regular programs in. We can keep it in uh, Git. We can inspect it for all sorts of compliance reasons. We can run unit tests against it, everything else. So using POI is great. But if we're going to use the JVM, we'd rather use Clojure, I think. Um, and uh, so when we, when we use Clojure, we get something much nicer. Um, there are two libraries that do this. They're called Docsure and CLJ Excel. And they're nice, but, um, oh, when, and, they can, and you can use POI in them, right, directly. So it's actually, they can do everything POI can do. Um, but they're still pretty complex, right? I'm still, you saw all this Excel stuff I did before, and that was all point and click, it was easy to do, it, you could do it super fast, um, but here now I'm writing code to do all of it. If I want a column to be a certain width, I have to like type in, in my program, the amount of width of that column. So let's take a different approach and let's mix the best of closure in Excel. And I'm, I'm gonna switch and we're gonna actually uh, write code now, because it's more fun. So, uh, okay, so the example I'm going to use today is I'm going to talk about a mythical stock portfolio that I have, and let me show you what that stock portfolio looks like. So here's my portfolio. The way I choose my stocks is I choose only companies that do at least some closure because I'm pretty convinced they're going to outperform the market. Um, <laughs> and so, 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 so here, here's the list of companies I've picked. Now, what I'm first going to do is I'm going to um, get a list of holdings with their history. 
Um, and I'm not going to talk much about how this works. I've got a, a function to do this, but I'm reaching out to Yahoo Finance and uh, getting the portfolio history for each of the stocks in my portfolio. So let's do that, and let's see what that looks like. Oops. It looks like the internet's not working up here. Hang on a sec. Um, it's okay. We've got saved data if that doesn't work. Let's, let's see if Closure West will come back. Ah, oh, I see it tries to save search networks. Okay. We'll try that again. That looks like it's working better. Um, this works a lot faster when I'm not at a conference. There we go. Um, so this is all the history. Just pulled back from Yahoo right now. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Yahoo doesn't have today's data. I was hoping we'd get today's data by the time we, we had this. But you see here we have a data structure. It's a sequence, and each, for each stock we have a map. Um, we've got Apple and name, number shares. This was all from the portfolio data. And then the history going back from yesterday to the beginning of the year. So we got a lot of information about all these uh, th shares of stock, and now I want to present that in a spreadsheet. So how would I do that? Well, the way I'm going to suggest we want to start doing that is to do it directly in Excel. So let's go talk to Excel, let's go talk to Excel and we'll uh, open a template file. I've got a template file waiting for us. Okay, and this is, this is our template, and it's pretty simple. We have a, um, let's see if I can reduce this a little bit. Actually, I think that's good. Um, so let's, so we have a title, and then we've got two days. There, there yesterday and yesterday in this case, because we don't have today's data. Um, and for each stock, we've got the name, of the, the ticker of the stock and the number of shares we own, some facts about the stock that came from that history for the previous day. And then we've got a formula right here, right? This is our holdings, which is just the close times the number of shares we have. Um, we have the sum of the holdings, which is also a formula. It's the sum of all those rows. Now, note that Microsoft is not one of these closure using companies, at least not as far as I know, but I just put it, it's just a template, right? It just goes in there as a stub row. And then we go across here, and we have the same for yesterday, um, and then uh, the same sorts of formulas. And then we have some change formulas out here um, that show... Uh, the change in share price, which is just yesterday's price minus the day before's price, um, and the change in total value, which is similar, and the percentage. Okay? And, uh, and summaries of that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to put the data into this template, and we want to render it as a spreadsheet. So let's come on over here, and we've got to, re we, we've got to reshape the data so it fits the template, and I've got a function to do that. I'm not going to go into that right now. We'll go into that a little bit. Um, but I want you to see what the data ends up looking like. Um, so we're going, to call, we're going to call it row data. And we're just going to make it right out of our holdings. OK, so this is pretty simple. This is a map. And the map has an entry for each worksheet we want to replace. The, we only have one worksheet in the spreadsheet. It's called portfolio. So we have a key for that. And then we have a map of the rows we want to replace. Rows we don't replace will simply be passed through from the template into the output. The first, this is zero-based indexing, which is a little confusing for Excel. But um, the first row, we're only replacing it with a single row. And that single row only has a single cell, portfolio status as of yesterday. The first row, the second row we leave alone. The third row, we're just putting in these two dates. Notice I have a lot of nils across here. That just also says pass through what was ever in the spreadsheet. And then the fifth row, we're replacing it with more than one row because we have actually more than one share, of, one type of stock in our portfolio. We have a row for Apple, we have a row for Akamai, we've got a row for Amazon, et cetera. Um, and each of these rows, rows, Ticker, number of shares, right? These were the columns we were looking at before. That's a spacer column, so we just leave it. Um, open, low, high, close. Now this nil here, um, once you get out, out right here, is the, uh, um, 
is where the formula is that does the amount of holdings, and et cetera, out to the rest of the line. We do this for all the lines. So now let's look at how we apply that. So this library only has two functions, render to file and render to stream, and they're both actually this, exactly the same. They take an argument, which is a template. In this case, we're gonna use portfolio template and it's just a completely regular, it's that completely regular um, Excel spreadsheet that we saw before. This comes from my resources directory, but could come from anywhere. We're gonna have an output file. I'm just gonna put it in temp. Okay, and then we need some data. Um, and we just made the data, it's that row data. So that's how we make an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, so let's see if that worked. This is always the exciting part. Um, looks like it makes, made something. 357, that's right now. Okay, so here's our, here's our portfolio. Um, Expand it out. Oh, I didn't show you we all, in the template. We also had uh, some graph, I mean, you'll see that in a sec. But Friday's data, yesterday's data, um, correct for each thing, um, changes. Yesterday was actually a good day in the market, um, and the only company that went down was Netflix, um, and that's just a correction because it went crazy up last week. But, uh, um, and here's our allocation for all our stock. We can see how much of each stock we own. This is our holdings allocation. So I built all of this off the template, um, and so that's pretty cool. Now, we have, now we're able to build a spreadsheet right out of some simple data. And I think you all know what happens next, right? We give this to our user, and they say, oh, that's pretty good, but you know what I wanted? I wanted the history of all my stocks on their own sheet. Could you give me that? And so we file some JIRA tickets and we get back to work. Um, and, I, and this is one of the key aspects of using templates, not only here, but everywhere we kind of use templates is, is the ability to turn things around rapidly. So let's turn this around rapidly. We're gonna make a new sheet. And again, we start in Excel. Right, unlike a traditional programming thing, where this is like if you're using in live, you start by writing HTML and then write the in live to inject data into the HTML. Um, here we start by writing the template and then we format the data to fit the template. So let me create a new sheet and let me make it so you guys in the audience can actually see the sheet while I'm creating it. Okay, and we're gonna call this sheet stock. Now we're going to have one of these sheets for every share. So this is a little funny. We can't bind it to one of the, the shares of stock and we can't do one for each um, type of uh, stock because we don't know a priori when our portfolio might be bigger or smaller or a different user might have a different portfolio. So we're just going to make one generic sheet and let Excel templates blow it out into multiple sheets. Um, so we'll call this sheet year to date performance for and we don't know what the stock is gonna be yet, so we'll just call it stock. And here we're just gonna put the ticker in because I'm gonna want that later. We wanna know how many shares we have of this stock because that will help us determine holdings. Uh, I'll just put a random number in here. That's a good number. Leave a blank line for space. And then what do we want for the history? So we'll just do the headings, date. We want the date for each day of the history. We want the open and the close. And then we, the change from yesterday would be nice. We're, People want history year to date, they probably want to know the change year to date as well, so let's put that in. And, they, and year to date percentage would be nice, because percentage is, is you know, normalized. And then we want to know the holdings value. Oh, that's kind of ugly, we, uh, our column's not wide enough. Um, luckily I don't have to round trip this through a program too many times, I can just widen that column with my mouse. Okay, um, now what's in each column? We need some sort of date. We, so I'm just, this is a template. I'm just filling it with random numbers, right? Um, so I can look at what they look like. Um, so we have open, close, change. Change doesn't make sense here, right? We only have one row. This is the first row, so we'll leave that for the moment. Um, year to date change kind of does because we can start from the opening of the year. So let's say it's the close. Oops, got a formula. Excel says equals for formula. And then we say that minus the open for the year. Um, those of you who know Excel, which is I suspect most of you will know I need dollar signs here to keep this from rolling down the page. Oh. There we go. So that gives us year-to-date change, which is five. Um, year-to-date percent change looks similar. It's, 
uh, close over the open. Again, we want that for the year and not to stay local. And we'll make that minus one, so it actually comes out as a percent. And then holdings is just the number of shares we own times the close today. And again, we want to lock that in as constant number. There we go. Okay, so that's great. Um, of course, one of the advantages we talked about in Excel is uh, formatting. So let's make this a little prettier. Um, We'll make that nice and big. We'll make this number have commas in it because those who know me know I like commas in my numbers um, a little obsessively. And then this headings are, are nice when they're bold. Um, dates, these, I, I hate this Excel default kind of date to know thing, right? So let's change this around and put the day after the month and give ourselves a couple days. And then these, these, we all want to be like dollars and things, right? So they have a couple decimal points and commas where we want them. This is the, there we go. Much nicer. Okay, and now um, this actually shouldn't be that. This should be percentage. And one decimal point is probably plenty. Very nice, okay. So now we got to deal with this fact we never, dealt, we never did anything about change. We need two rows in order to express the idea of change from day to day. So we'll make two rows there, and then this is that minus that. Cool. So now we have something that should give us a history chart, but we got to get data into it. And we got to get this page to reproduce. Right? So it reproduces for each of our, our things. So let me... walk through here, and build us a structure. Now, the first thing we want is to have one of those maps. Remember, we had a map that described how to replace the rows. We want one of those for each of our, our shares of stock. So let's start with that. And the way to, to get a sequence, a good way to get a sequence of things, and those of you who were here for the last talk will have heard about destructuring as pattern matching. Let's do that here. But we'll use the four macro and, de and do key destructuring. Um, and what we want to do is get the data out for each uh, share of stock. And that is a symbol, a name, a um, number of shares, and the history that we got. Um, based on our holdings that we already have. So this is the same data we already had. Again, we're reshaping it now, but just in a different way. Okay, and now you remember that when we got that information, what we got was, actually, let's reformat this so it's easier for you guys to read. There we go. What we, what we did is we had a map for each thing to replace the row. So let's start again that same thing. So the first row, again, we're gonna replace it with one thing, which is a string. Now there's no string templating that goes on here, so if we have to replace a string, we have to replace the whole thing. And we'll use the full name of the stock. Oh, I forgot one thing here. Um, so since we're replacing one sheet with multiple sheets, what Excel templates would do left to its own devices is call it stock and stock one and stock two and stock three, but we want better tab names on that. So let's uh, put the symbol on the, on the name of the sheet, and we have a special key for that. Okay. okay, now the second line that we have was just that um, three, that we had two things we wanted to put on there. We wanted to put the ticker on, and the middle thing was that shares label, but then we want to put the number of shares. Okay, so that gives us a row. Now the interesting part, we actually want to write the history. And remember, we had two rows that we used to describe the history, because we had to describe that change, right? So we have rows, rows four and five, or five and six, depending on which base you're using. Um, and so we use this little vector to say, replace both these rows with this data. And this data is just the history. And again, we'll use exactly the same pattern we used above. Um, and what do we need from the history? We need the date, the open, and the close. 
Everything else was computed from that. Okay, and remember the history was backwards from today back to history. I want it to go the other way, so I'll reverse it. So it starts at the beginning of the year and goes until now. Okay, and then always it's a four, so we have to give some outputs. Just date, open, close. Okay, so that's our stock history. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so here we see Walmart at the bottom. Um, we see here we have the sheet name is the ticker. The first line is year-to-date performance for Walmart, perfect. Um, we replace the first thing with the ticker for the stock and then there's that label and then 900 shares. Um, and then we replace those other two lines with this long list of everything from the first market day of the year until now. So how do we put that into the spreadsheet? Let's just take our previous invocation. Now you remember row data was just a map of a page name to the data for that page. The page name was portfolio for the first page. I'm just going to assash on another page name here. It's called stock. We remember we called that page stock. And we'll put this stock history on. Right, so we're just combining the two things into a single map. Okay, so let's see what we got there. Again, the moment of truth, see if it worked. Um, gave it the same output, 408, excellent. Uh, <laughs> that's a good sign, and here we go. Here's the, the history for, and if, I don't know how, you, how, many, how many of you can see the bottom tabs, but we have tabs for all the different shares as well as our original um, portfolio <laughs> tab. And we can see we have all the fields filled in. This first row has no change, but then all the rest of the ones do. We have year-to-date change. Uh, this is for Apple, and by now, Apple's up about $16 on the year, or uh, 14%, right? Um, similarly, if we look at Amazon, um, we can look that Amazon's up about 24%. So, so we get all this historic data. We get all these worksheets built for us off that simple template. But of course, you know what happens next. The, the user comes back, and the user says, I love that history, but I can't tell relatively how well my stock is doing, right? So what I really want is one chart that shows everything to me on my, uh, on my whole portfolio and lets me compare which shares are doing best. So you're like, OK, Excel's supposed to be good at charting. Let's get a chart in here and a chart that combines all that data. So then the, really what we want to do is we want to track year-to-date percent change over the year to see the, the performance. And this is pretty easy with point and click. Um, I'm back in the template now, by the way, if you, if you weren't following that. Um, we go to the charts tab and we make a line chart um, of this data. And this is a really exciting line chart right now, but <laughs> that's, how, that's how things go in the templates. The templates usually aren't very exciting. You want the output to be more exciting. Um, so let's... Uh, Pick the data for it. Um, I'm going to give each series the name of the stock. Remember, this cell I'm picking now gets replaced by the ticker symbol um, in the final result. Um, and then I want to actually have it know that it should use the dates as the Y labels, because that's a lot nicer. OK. so. That's a nice chart. Let's give it a generic title rather than a title based on the given stock. Um, we'll call it year-to-date performance. OK, so that's pretty easy. We need to put it on its own worksheet so it doesn't actually get cloned along with these worksheets. Um, it's easy in Excel. You just move chart, and we'll call this. OK, so now this is a completely derivative thing I've just done. I haven't used any new data from the backing data that Clojure has. So I actually don't need to, that would be nice if I corrected my own spelling here. Oh. There we go. Much better. So we don't have to do anything to the Clojure data to make this work, except save the spreadsheet. Um, so we just rerun the render to file. I'll have to write a, a boot task to make this uh, automatically reload um, when you save the template. <laughs> um, but so here we see, OK, uh, let's see what happened to that. That should have rebuilt it. 
and voila, we have our year-to-date stock history performance. Um, so it, it past performance isn't a guarantee of future success. You should have brought Netflix, um, which is that top orange line, which is huge two huge run-ups this year. Um, but we can now compare directly the, the shares that we have, and this was built automatically, and all the series were cloned and everything else. Um, so, that's, so that's that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how this works, this idea of data as API. And if, if any of you were in Janine's talk earlier, she was talking about data-driven architectures and language design. Here we only have two functions, and all of the logic lives, and these two functions are identical except for their output styles. Um, so all the logic that drives them, that makes them any more complex than yesterday's upcase example that Alan and Misha gave, is in the data structure that is built into the template and in the data structure that's built into the replacement structure, right? So we've created a language here, and I think this is a common idiom, which is why I'm emphasizing it, um, that we want to use in a lot of places. We're only using data structures, but it really is a language to describe what we want out the other side. And we can build it, in fact, we have, because we have to keep ourselves organized when we work on this, an almost formal grammar to describe how the language works. And, uh, and how to parse it to decide what the user's, um, the user's desires are. So that's pretty much what I got. I, got, I, want, to, I want to review some of the big ideas I was talking about today. Um, the first idea is software is communication. Okay, so when we build software, we need to think about our user, again, this uh, channels some of Janine's earlier talk, I think. We need to think about what our user is, is, needs from that software and how to best embrace what they're doing. I think, especially when we go to Excel, but in lots of other cases, we sometimes resist that and try and do what's easy for us um, by jumping the boundary and finding ways to communicate, we can be much more successful. One of the interesting examples here is we were able to find a way where life is not that much harder for us now than it was before, and yet we're able to communicate much, much better, right? We're able to use these rich spreadsheets, but still able to live in our world of closure data. So that's a pretty nice win. Use the right tool for the right job. Now the important thing is, the right tool is not always a single tool, right? We saw in the examples of Excel earlier um, that we had things that were only in Excel, things that were not really in either, CSVs, right? And things that were only in Java or Clojure, right? And none of those were kind of the right tool. What we really want to do is use Clojure for the data parts that Clojure is really good at, and use Excel for the parts where Excel, I'm going to resist the pun. Uh, someone, <laughs> someone else went for it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Um, so, but use Excel where it's good, right? Because Excel is really great at a lot of things in quantitative information presentation and management. And then finally, we want to think about this idea of data as API. Um, I think that's a very powerful idea. You've seen that in a lot of talks here. Um, I think you'll see it in a lot of places in Clojure, and it's another thing to embrace and work with. Okay, I want to make some acknowledgments. Uh, this work was largely supported by Staple Sparks when I was consulting there. Um, great group of uh, folks. Uh, you guys should check them out if you're looking for closure work and stuff. Um, and then uh, to Jeb, who's back there someplace, I saw him, uh, who's my collaborator on this and has, has contributed, for example, the multiple worksheet stuff that you guys saw. Um, so that's that. Uh, it's all on GitHub. It's released through Clojars, and you can just uh, link to it. Some of the stuff I showed today isn't yet in the release version, but it will be in the next week or so. Um, and the sample code that I was showing is also up there on GitHub, so you can play with that. There's a long blog post on my blog, too, about an earlier version of this. Um, lots of credits for photos and stuff. And that's it. And we actually have a few minutes for questions, if people want questions. <laughs> Yeah. Have you tried this? Uh, I, sorry if I missed this while I had to step out for a second, but have you tried any of this with, say, open or LibreOffice? Has it been an active practice? So we haven't completely tested it with LibreOffice in a, in a sense of exhaustively, um, but Jeb in particular uses LibreOffice in, during his development. It works fine. Sure. Right, so. yeah, Aaron. Have you done any work uh, round tripping data back out, so you know, user makes changes to the you know, add data to the spreadsheet? 
No, um, and there has been some interest in that. It's not actually particularly a goal of mine, um, but I think there could be some related work where that made a lot of sense. Um, one of those other libraries I showed has a mode where it can read, uh, and I can't remember if it's Doctor or CLJ Excel, but it has a mode where it can read in Excel spreadsheets and just turn them into maps, which is kind of nice. Um, using POI, it is actually pretty easy to do. Um, so, it's, so one use mode could be create something with a template, read back modifications using POI and, and so on. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff you could do there. Um, one of the really interesting things here to me actually in, in, in that model is allowing users to write their own templates, right? Where you create data, users can format it, they can request additions. You saw how we can replace ranges, for instance, right? I do that for pragmatic reasons because I need to be able to express certain concepts that are intercell concepts. Um, but the same thing could go where someone oh, reformatted something, you just wanted to replace their, treat their thing as, as the template and, and replace it. And, and that's a powerful way to get you, give Excel power users who might be your users who might want more derived data inside the report to control the report. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that library. He, he's mentioned a library called JXLS that uh, is a uh, Groovy, or it's, it's a Java library that you've used from Groovy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds cool. Yeah, it sounds a similar idea. Anything else? Oh, huh? Oh. I worry about that so you don't have to. <laughs> you do a little bit, but, but, but largely if you do what you think is right in writing the formulas in the template, my code will correctly expand it, right? Um, at some point I'll write a longer explanation of the rules for how that happens. Up in the back. No, this is just a regular Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, whatever you, whatever you want. Was there another one back? Do you have any opinions on version control using templates? It's kind of as lousy, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've thought a little bit about that. Um, and I basically, so, so for those of you who don't know, inside, um, Excel files are a zip file of a directory of XML files, right? Um, and it's actually a pretty nice format for what it's doing when you get inside and get used to it, but it's big and messy and everything else. Um, it's hard for me to believe that someone hasn't thought about source code controlling XL the XLS, the XLSX format, um, that's a tongue twister, um, by expanding the zip and then, and then source code controlling the parts, which is a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, but I don't know if that work, right? And, and that would be kind of the way you'd want to go. It's a more general Excel problem. Anything else? Okay, I think we're done. Thanks for coming. <laughs>